Welcome to the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. Bags on chair backs and arson out banners, marches in car parks and profits on transfers. Heavy defeats are what big games will bring. These are a few of our favorite things. Buying good players who sit on the subs bench, no one in sight who knows how to play defense. Waiting to see what the trolley dash brings. These are a few of our favorite things. When the league's gone and it's August, I feel pretty bad. But then I remember he's here two more years and I long for the sweet embrace of death. That's right, this is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith and you can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. We are going to cover the disaster that is Arsenal Football Club. That's right, it's the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. Crisis edition. So without further ado, let's get into it. It's time to introduce the panel that will be discussing the collapse of the club we all love so much. First, I want to introduce Tim, and I have a special introduction for Tim that was given to me by A underscore Zafar10 on Twitter, who during uh, an exchange of ideas between several people uh, provided this retort to someone who disagreed with Tim. No, you aren't entitled to your opinion. Don't you realize you're talking to a columnist for the fabled Ars blog? He is God of Twitter. That's Tim. You can find him on Twitter at Stilberto. Hello, God of Twitter. Too right. Too damn right. I, you were very pleased at that when it happened, if I recall correctly. Um, yes, and why absolutely. wouldn't you be? Nothing else is going right for us these days. Uh, you can find Paul on Twitter just at pausing in my pants. Uh, Paul, no special introduction for you, but still thrilled to have you. Well, uh, uh, trying to keep up with that one, uh, I'm no longer going by the name of Paz Stark. I, I wish to be known as the Three-Eyed Raven. Pazgarian? Everything, yeah. <laughs> Aegon Pazgarian? that has ever happened, everything that happens now, we, possibly everything that happens in the future. Here's the good news. We know everything that's happened will happen again because it's continually happening to us uh, on a season-by-season basis at Arsenal. Um, and Clive is on Twitter at Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. I am blessed to be in your company. I agree. Um, I will let you know that none of these fine panelists have heard the song that intros this pod at the time of this recording, so none of them have uh, any kind of comment or abuse for me to provide uh, uh, about that topic. Anyway, so let's dive in. Look, um, we are recording this on uh, Tuesday. There's already been a lot of news that's come out since the match. Uh, All the craziness is going on literally as we speak. Ox going to Chelsea, Alexis seemingly... Uh, going to City, proving once again that the manager should never be taken at his word. But we will get to all of that. I want to stay with the match for a moment. Uh, An historic 4-0 loss that I think in some ways uh, felt like a sea change. And there have been so many of these that it's hard to feel like any of them uh, are a turning point at this point. But this one certainly seems to have had ramifications. But let's stick to the match for starters. And Tim, just to kind of kick it off, the lineup. Um, Mm -hmm. The manager defended his lineup by saying this was the team that beat Chelsea in the FA Cup. I have a lot of trust in them and faith in them. But at the end of the day, you strengthen your team in the summer to make your team better. And having a better team presumably gives you a better chance to win. What is the thought process behind bringing in two players that presumably you believe strengthen you? A Bundesliga team of the year left wing back and a 50 million pound striker and leaving them on the bench for the first big game of the season. How do you justify it? Um, I, don't, I don't know anymore. Um, I really, really don't know. I'm, I'm really running out of uh, ways to, to, to kind of try and justify all of this. Really, I was um, once upon a time professionally. I, I kind of um, did a little turn as, as an investigator, and I was trained as an investigator. And one of the things they kind of train you to do is look at every single possibility that you can. Try and find logic for absolutely everything, even if you think it's wrong, um, because you might find the answer. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm exactly the type of person who probably does 
mental gymnastics trying trying to find logic in things that uh, where there doesn't appear to be much and um, this is this has just got me stumped I don't know I mean he played Alex Oxlade Chamberlain and he's selling him 24 hours later um, so it, it must have been he it must have been in the offing you don't ju- you know you don't just play someone and then immediately decide to sell them this was in the post um, again putting Hector Bellerin <laughs> at, at left wing back no idea um, hasn't worked you know hasn't remotely worked I mean the player himself hasn't been in his best form in his natural position anyway uh, so moving him out of his natural position don't know um, Rob Holding, he dropped last week because he was low on confidence. Well, wasn't it just a master stroke to play him here alongside Alex Oxlade Chamberlain, who, um, you know, looked like he'd rather be anywhere else in the world. And he wasn't alone in that. Um, I know probably 10 of his teammates and 3,000 of us behind the goal <laughs> probably shared that feeling. But, you know, this, hopefully this hasn't ruined Rob Holding too much, but he, you know, he looked very shaky again and it's difficult to blame him for that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, you play Welbeck up front, I guess, because, you know, you want him to do all that good stuff like pressing uh, their centre-halves and, you know, their goalkeeper who seemed to be determined to try and make the game at least slightly interesting. Um, and we didn't really take him up on that invitation and, and so that he can run the channels and everything. But Lacazette does all that anyway, um, but he can finish. So I, I I don't really understand that one. I understand perfectly why Welbeck's a very useful player and a very good player, but I, I don't think he really does anything that Lacazette doesn't, but Lacazette can score. Um I, I knew he was going to do this with the wing backs again. I, I think I might have said it on the last pod. I'm absolutely convinced he'll do it again because this doesn't seem to be about what's best for the team. It seems to be about pandering to individuals as, as far as we can see. And uh, yeah, it was, it was really difficult. I think we discussed on the last one as well what we might do in central midfield because I think we've all had um, voiced reservations about what one of the bigger teams might do to Ramsey and Jacker. Um and I think I, I don't think any of us imagined it would be this bad. I mean, um, they both seem to go completely rogue. I mean, neither of them are particularly defensively minded anyway, but they both seem to go for the absolute nuclear option. Um, and so we did, we didn't really take care of that area. And uh, Jonathan Wilson wrote a, a brilliant piece last week about what he called the red zone, um, or I, th- I think actually it's Omar Hitzfeld who refers to it as the red zone that area between the edge of your 18-yard box and the centre circle um, about taking care of that area. And he was basically saying, Arsenal do not take care of this area at all. And um, he couldn't have picked a better game to write that article before than this one because we completely abandoned that area of the pitch. And um, yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure how much of this is actually down to team selection um, because with the exception of you know yeah you can maybe say that Lacazette should have played ahead of Welbeck and with the exception of this balmy thing where Bellerin's playing at left wing back I mean that was our first choice central midfield um, pretty close to our first choice back three Um, we had Alexis and Ozil uh, operating behind a mobile striker this this should have been close to our best team and um, it looks like a lot of those intangibles were definitely in play. In fact, they looked tangible to me, the lack of effort, the lack of running. Um, I think there was one point where Chamberlain and Ramsey, just before the first goal maybe, were both like not even looking at the ball when Liverpool win it back. And mm-hmm. So all, all of those kind of intangibles add up and it's, it's difficult to get a read on how much the team selection uh played into that really because with the exception of the wing backs there was nothing there that I was you know massively concerned about it was just more you know we're really weak in transitions Liverpool are really strong on them and we we must we absolutely we've had a week since the last game they must have spoken about that on the training ground they must have um so I mean you you say that (laughs) well yeah yeah. It, it does kind of look like the players just went completely rogue um, on Arsenal, unless he's even worse than, than I think he's getting. And he, he was telling Ramsey and Jacker to be on the edge of the Liverpool penalty area. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know. So it, it's difficult to understand how far this is tactical, how far it's 
mental um, and and how far these players have just thrown the towel in on this manager. And here we are 51 hours after the game. He hasn't resigned yet. And that to me means he lacks professional pride because he should. Yeah. I mean, I I think that's pretty strong. I mean, suggesting that anyone with professional pride would would resign, I think is getting off the fence. So kudos to you. Um, You know, there are a couple of things you say it, it couldn't have been the plan, but you could argue that, you know, we tried pressing early. We're not a team that is practiced and drilled at pressing. And maybe what happens when you tell some players, hey, just go press them and get in their area, that that starts out fine for the first five, 10 minutes. But what it turns out, you know, to be because of a lack of training and preparation is just people standing in the opposition half not understanding what to do when they don't have the ball. And you saw the difference between a team that has no intensity off the ball and a team that does. Now, uh, Clive, I'll get to you in a second. Uh, let, me, let me ask this. Uh, Paul, if you are a player for Arsenal, preparation and training aside, you know, there have been claims that the manager lost the team, that, that he's lost the dressing room, that the players gave up, whatever it may be. What do you think the reaction is internally as a player to seeing Oxley Chamberlain, who every player will know is about to leave or wants to leave, being started ahead of Kolasinac, who or Kolasinac, who was brought in, you know, as a a quality player for that very position, and Lacazette not being started in favor of, you know, a player who, with all due respect to him, isn't really a finisher. And we saw that, by the way, the first chance of the match really does fall to Arsenal. It falls to Danny Welbeck, and he fluffs his lines. I mean. Do you think those kinds of decisions set players out onto the pitch already of the mind that they're at a disadvantage? I mean, we saw it in the Liverpool game away last season when he, quote, punished Alexis and left him on the bench, and we really had an insipid, lifeless first-half performance. Do you think that some of what's being read into is losing the dressing room stemmed from the decisions the manager made? Um, It's a witch's brew. I mean, yeah. I think there's something bigger that, that kind of like Tim's point on the lineup. I think there's something bigger. That's the problem to analyze these things. I think your points are really valid. I think in another game, you could do some kind of regret, you know, you, you, you could isolate that aspect of it, but there's just something bigger went wrong. Um, something fundamental, something something we haven't seen in the past except maybe for a period towards the start of 2017. It's that funk um, that we really ha- haven't seen during Arsene's tenure. And at other times I might have argued with people about him who had said losing the dressing room, but this to me looked like an utterly shot dressing room. This looked like... Um, like... Uh, he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what hit him. Um, I, I thought he was very... Uh, I, I'd be interested in Tim's view of this because you only see what you see on the TV, but he looked very passive on the bench. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, they all did. Yeah. I mean, that's not a new I, thing particularly. But, well, let me ask you this, Paul. I mean, in, in terms of, you know, the, the sort of insipid, lifeless performance, I get that. But do you have any thoughts on why a manager who's been in this position before. I mean, he did pick Nasri for a game against Liverpool, ironically, right before selling him, and Nasri turned in nearly a man-of-the-match performance. Um, yeah. Can you wrap your head around Kolasinac being on the bench in favor of one away Oxley chamberlain uh, not, not for this game, though that doesn't mean I don't think this lineup should have performed. Uh, it should have. I mean, it, it, now, I mean, it's, it's not ideally... clearly not our best lineup. He did not pick our best lineup. Circumstance aside, he did not pick our he best lineup. He did not lineup. pick our best lineup. He did pick a lineup that should have been able to compete in this game. Oh, they shouldn't uh, have uh, lost 4-0. Of course not, no. No, and they should have been... You know, there was a period of maybe five or ten minutes where we started to look like we were getting into the game before they scored their second. I think leading up to, like, about... Was the goal around 33 minutes or something like that? There was a period... I'm not saying we were any good. I'm not saying we were their equal. But it started to look like we were starting to play. We weren't getting into the most dangerous areas of the final third, but we were getting into the final third. And... You know, but that's all you had. You had about five or ten minutes in the game where it looked like we might be able to get on terms with them. But that was what did them the most favors because they were at their most deadly counterattacking. So, uh, yeah, certainly Kalasana for me is the biggest omission. I was okay with Danny up front. 
uh, given that we had Alexis on the field, which gave us some, some, you know, that combination of the two of them. I know that Tim says that Lacazette uh, and Danny, Lacazette gives us everything Danny does. I'm not sure. I think uh, I think he does a bit of everything Danny does. I don't think anybody does what Danny does really in the league almost uh, as effectively as Welbeck does it. Uh, but when that first but, chance falls to him, you see exactly why he's yeah. not, not, you know, a 100 million pound striker, you know. Yeah, but I could see a combo of Welbeck and Sanchez in theory working, except it, uh, I guess it didn't take uh, a genius to realize that Alexis would not be sharp. Well, and have the courage of um, your convictions. If you think yeah. Welbeck is the striker to start the big games for you, don't spend $50 million on Lacazette, no, much, no matter how much pressure well, you're on. Uh, spend uh, it on a central on. midfielder. Well, no, but, but uh, Paul, I think we overdo But we can't overdo it that every lineup is every game. I'm, of course f- I'm not. fine with, technical fle- with uh, tactical flexibility. I'm fine that the lineup was different. I don't think he put out our best lineup. It wasn't a terrible lineup. It was the worst possible performance. Um, so, wh- Paul, while I, I think I never felt that Lucas Perez should have started ahead of Alexis last season. I understood when we bought Lucas Perez what he was bought for. When you buy Lacazette for $50 million, you're saying, I-, I am buying a guy that I believe will be our best chance to give us the goals we need up front this season. And while I certainly agree with you about tactical flexibility, picking an inferior striker over him for the first big game of the season, to me, Ray begs Elliot, the question why small. you needed Lacazette. He's small. He's quiet. He's influential. Um, he's a guy who doesn't actually get that many touches outside of the final, uh, final third, particularly the penalty box area. Danny does something different tactically. Uh, I can if see I why you want we've him struggled. running the channel. Small games or big games under Arsene Wenger over the last decade, which would you say? Say that again? If I said to you, which has been our biggest bugaboo, our bigger struggle over the last 10 years, small teams or big teams away? Obviously, big teams okay. away. So to me, if you're going to spend $50 million on a striker, the one thing you should really expect of him is that he's the kind of guy that can switch this, this mire, this funk you've been in, in big away games, right? I mean, at a minimum, you should be buying players to turn that around because I, I don't want to repeat it on the pod. It's all over the internet right now, but our record away at the top six over the last five, six, seven years is, is, is appalling. And surely, if you're going to spend 50 million pounds on influential players, those are games you should be targeting, right? That's fine as a headline, but you've got to look at the players and you've got to be tactical. Unfortunately, nobody showed up on that pitch to do anything when they got out there. But I have no problem with Danny Welbeck starting. I would have had not too much problem with Giroud starting at this point in the season. You know, you get like this each season, Elliot, where we buy a player and you demand that he always starts. But, well, I, I get that, you know, but I think there's we, a difference between demanding a Lucas we, starts and Lacazette starts. I, well, at least give me that. Well, Chaka should start at the start of last season. But guess what? There were issues with Chaka. There's integration into the team. So in a huge game, uh, I'm not saying the manager got it, got it right, but that's not the same as he got it completely wrong. There is an he started a team why. that should have done better than it should. We will certainly oh, yeah, agree yeah, there. Massively. Look, I don't disagree with you, and I don't think he picked a bad team. I don't think he picked his best team. And as far as the integration issue, I would suggest if he's starting opening day and if he's starting at Stoke, and oh, by the way, the one guy who finished a chance at Stoke that should have been a goal, you know, I mean, for me, it's difficult to see the integration issue. And again, look, I'm not well, here, saying here's Welbeck part of your isn't integration good. Issue. He wanted, obviously wanted to start Sanchez, which I think, uh, I think the idea of keeping Sanchez and Ozil in the team where they don't want to sign uh, is ridiculous. I thought that was going to blow up in our face during this season. But he wanted to start Sanchez. Well, guess what? Welbeck has at least played with Sanchez once in his life. Which is some. Uh, no, was, I get you. We we got to get Clive in here pretty soon because yeah. it's we're seventeen, yeah. eighteen minutes in, and, and Go so far no Clive. But <laughs> look, I I definitely see your point. I just think, um, it, it's a question that that I think is fair to ask, especially given that we haven't performed in these big away games, and and you finally make a big acquisition. And for me, the excitement would be 
maybe this is the, the key that's going to turn the lock. I don't know. So, so Clive. It, it is. I just wasn't hung up with the first away game being the one. You, you, you still got to win it, and you pick the team you think will win it on the day. Obviously, he cocked it up. Well, he did. I mean, and that, look, ultimately, it's a results-based business, and when you lose 4-0 in, in meek fashion, that's it. But, Clive, but I, I want to get to some of the meta issues with you, but let's talk tactics just for a minute. There's a part of me that sees this as being, as I said, a sea change, a turning point moment, a, a something that feels very significant. And yet, playing in the back three last season, what was our worst game with the back three? The North okay. London Derby at Spurs. You remember? Yep. Yeah, on, not to overplay the XG thing, but on XG, I think we lost that like three, 2.6 or th- 3.6 to 0.6. And we lost this one 3.9 to 0.6. They're both hammerings. But they're very similar. They're against pressing teams that don't give you time in midfield against very, very similar 11s that the manager picked with very similar tactical approaches. Um, Putting the meta issues aside for a minute, what what is it about the way we're playing football right now that not just has us losing these games but incapable of competing when we are pressed in midfield? There's lots of things, right? Uh, Not respecting the opposition is one. We don't... um... We pick the players that we like. I've said it before. We pick the players that we like. And when we close our eyes and we we think of their names on the team sheet, we think of them on the ball. And there's two sides of the game, right? There are three phases of the game. On the ball, off the ball, and transition. And in transition, we are one of the worst teams in the league. When we That moment when we lose the ball and our reaction time is really, really slow. I mean, I've, I've been involved in scouting players and seeing scouting sheets. I never realised what an important factor that was. They call it on-the-ball psychology, right? And they, and they, they how fast you switch. Like Alexis Sanchez has got an amazing switch. When he loses it, he's straight back after it. It's instant. And we all see it and we all, we all love him for him. And there are others that just don't care, right? And that, and that was massively highlighted at the weekend. And so... And there's, I keep thinking back to the Chelsea game right, and how we won that game and what we did in midfield. And we literally had Shaka with three players ahead of him. And what they did really smartly, Alexis, Ramsey and Ozil, as a three, they started high. And as we built play, they came from behind Kante and Matic and then received the ball. So as we are building it wide, they came from behind, got in front. So Kante and Matic couldn't block off their passing lanes. And what we did in this game is that we hid. We hid behind the lines. We hid behind Henderson, Cam and Wijnaldum. We couldn't be found. We couldn't build. So we ended up going square in the areas of the pitch that we don't like. Until eventually they they put a trap in place and, and won the ball. And Shaka gave the ball away and the rest is history. Right. So um so tactically we are not at the races, but you know what, Ella, this isn't about lineup. This is about a breakdown in in leadership, and this is about a culture of mediocrity that's been going on for many, many years. Those players are good enough to beat Liverpool if they they want to. They're good enough to beat City, they're good enough to beat Chelsea, they're good enough to beat Liverpool. Do they not want to because something's wrong with them or because they don't believe in the project? They don't believe in the project. And I think, you know, if you're looking for a theory as to why our new signings didn't start, I think this game was lost before kickoff, as it was last year at Anfield. It was lost before kickoff. Wenger prioritised issues with the players that he wanted to keep rather than picking the team that he want, that potentially could have won the game. And that sends messages. There's obviously a breakdown in relationships and players are challenging him. He is being challenged. And the only way they can challenge him is by downing tools on the football pitch. There is no way, watching some of those recovery runs, that all those players are putting in maximum effort. We know that. So when, you know, I love to look at the game tactically. I love to look at certain things. We've, you know, you, you heard me sort of slaughter the love centre midfield last week. Well, that was only magnified this week. Nothing's been learned. In fact, the distances were even bigger. And now the TV have picked up on it. And it's just, it's just something that we have had in our team for many, many years. Sometimes we get away with it. Sometimes we don't. Those players in there, they are revered. I don't revere them. I don't revere them because they don't respect both sides of the game. Until they do, you won't you won't get me revering them. I like all Arsenal players, but I will not hold up players who play like that on the pedestal. No way. It's not team-related in any way, and they are allowed to get away with it. 
And I always say it, you do what you are allowed to do. When you go to work and your boss turns up late, guess what? You turn up late as well. You turn up five minutes before him. You do what you're allowed to do. And it's the environment at Arsenal that's wrong. There is no, I'm sorry to say it again, there is no urgency to win. There is no urgency to make changes. There is no urgency or accountability. You've heard me say this stuff a thousand times. I really don't, I can't sound clever tonight because everyone agrees. There, there is no, there is no, there is no urgency. There is nobody there saying we have to make changes now. Sometimes when, when Arsenal go bad, what I do is I look at other sports. And one of the other sports that I like is rugby. Right? And um, when England went to win the World Cup in 2003, they had a six-year plan. And they eventually won the World Cup with a drop goal the last minute. But you know what? They never had a plan for when they won the World Cup. A number of players retired, and then they fell off the they fell off the face of the earth for two three years until they came back in 2007. They had. So I always bring that back to Arsenal. We had a plan to get to the Emirates. We had a plan to get to 2014 when we could increase our sponsorship and revenues. When we could get out some of those deals we were that were really holding us back. And then we gave Wenger two more years to try and do something. But we never had a plan to take us through the next level. We had a plan to move to the ground. We had a plan to survive and stay in the Champions League for a number of years. But once we had the money, we didn't have the people infrastructure to take us to the next level. So we have depended on this old group of people that don't actually know how to do it. Yeah. And that is what's become really clear in the last few years. And it just depends if you can see those indicators. And I've seen them for about since 2014, and I'm sure many other people have. And um, and then you've got to decide how you want to enjoy your football, right? And so and I've decided to look at it tactically and get involved in the, in, in the coaching side of things because this club and organisation is um, set in stone. This is it. And with stone is falling, and it's um, very distressing to see. Yeah, and, and you know, you look at the teams that Arsene Wenger has struggled with, and why is he getting worse? He's getting worse because tactic or, ta tactical managers are getting better, and there are more and more of them in the league. I mean, when he was winning leagues, it was him and Ferguson, to some extent. Who did he struggle with? Look who he struggled with. He, he struggled with Benitez. He struggled with Jose. He struggles with Pochettino. He struggles with Klopp, right? I mean... He he's, seems like the rate of change is accelerating. Yeah, and and, and the yeah, number of managers and he is the slowest of quit of decision makers. He he wants to feel every deci decision is the right decision, and that's a bad combination. Yeah, especially as things yeah. are changing more rapidly. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Clive. Yeah, he's a great guy, right? But what he hasn't done, he hasn't renewed his organization quickly enough. He hasn't laid himself, he hasn't lifted himself above the day-to-day. -day. He wants to do everything. So anybody in any sort of corporate environment, they, what you do when you want to lift yourself and, and drive your career is you lay yourself with good people. You, you hire people who are better than you. And what that does is that creates an environment of continuous improvement and a, a culture of excellence. And he hasn't done that. He's kept people around him because he likes them. He's done that on the coaching staff. He's done that on the Or because staff. they won't challenge him. Or because they won't uh, challenge it, him. I think that is a huge part Because they won't challenge him. Exactly. I was I said something similar today. The moment he gets challenged, they get sold. Right? Or they go. Okay. And um, I, was, I, was, I was very fortunate one day. I went to watch Arsenal train one time. And it was a time when Seth Fabregas was still there. And I spent a whole day there till about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I watched them train. I had lunch with all the players. And basically, I looked around. And Fabregas was just before he left. And I looked around the club. And I realized that actually, behind the scenes, the club isn't very big. It's just a finite family feel. And I looked at Fabregas and I thought to myself, you're too big for this club. I often say that why I'd love to see Arsenal be as big as they actually are. And on the outside, we our fan base is massive. The support we have around the world is massive. The interest in the club is huge. But then you look at who's in charge of the club. We have an absent owner and we have aged coaching staff, aged directors. We have poor people quality in the background of our club. And until we upgrade those people and create a culture of action, we are just not going to move forward. Yeah, and it's been that way probably for a while now, if we're being honest. And I think, 
uh, there were there were a lot of things in this match that sort of highlighted that things aren't right. Not just the the meta issues, but the specific issues. Tim Ramsey gets subbed, and the manager alludes to it after the game that there were reasons that he can't go into. Let's go into the fun mm-hmm. world of speculation. Was it just that he's shit? There were rumors of a fight in the dressing room. What do you know? What do you suspect? What do you believe about the Aaron Ramsey situation? Again, I don't really know because another you know story's come out about how he, how he had a slight calf injury um, or something like that. <laughs> I well, bet there is one. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, and, and to be honest, that's not really a far out explanation, is it? That happens quite not, a lot. Not with Aaron Ramsey, no. But but you would no, exactly. think you would think in the heat of the moment, given the opportunity to bring that up, instead of saying I can't go into what the issues were, the manager would just state that he had a knock. I mean, you know, why why put yeah. gas on the fire? Yeah, indeed. And again, with a lot of his comments lately, it's, it's very, very difficult to make sense um, to make sense of them, uh, to make sense of what he's saying and what he means. Whether he's just saying stuff for the sake of it to get him out of there, um, whether you know there's any meaning behind it, I, I don't really know. It all just seems so muddled and confused. At, at the time that it happened, <clears throat> I fully expected at least one substitution at half time, because I mean, you know, Ar- Arsenal. It usually takes a crisis for him to make a half-time substitution. Who do you think he'll be, Tim? Who did you think he'll be? I thought it might be Alexis um, just on the basis of of uh, fitness and sharpness um, and because he had Lacazette on the bench. I, I And not that I thought Alexis deserved to be hooked any more than any other player. Frankly, it could have been any of them, um, really, but... I thought it might be Alexis. I thought maybe Ozil, maybe Jacker, maybe Ramsey. Um, actually, I didn't think it would be Chamberlain because all of a sudden he's become untouchable um, until today because we're selling him. Um, another <laughs> great example of the joined up thinking that's happening. Um, at the time, I, d- I didn't really think there was much behind it at all. I just thought, yeah, well, this is a, a tactical switch, uh, Coquelin for Ramsey. Um, it's worth saying, you know, Coquelin got 100% pass completion um, in the second half when he was on, so um, that's something. Um, and it, it kind of felt a little bit like damage limitation, um, but then, you know, he shifted the system around. I, I don't know, really. There's there's so much of this stuff that seems to be around at the moment, and there's so much, there's so much hearsay about, oh, there was a fight in the dressing room, or this happened. I mean, it's it's not that far fetched to believe, is it? Because it doesn't look like a happy camp. It doesn't look like people are pulling in the right direction. Um, a you know, fight they in don't... the dressing room is almost a positive at this point, isn't it? It is. I agree. I agree. I, I I'd want there to be a fight after this, but then again, that doesn't correlate with what you see on the pitch because nobody no. seemed to be raising their voice in anger at anyone. And um, you know, so, so I, I remember going to a and I think with Lee Dixon last year or something. And don't get me wrong, a, a lot of the punditry, I think Lee Dixon is a good pundit, but, uh, yeah. you know, a, a lot of um, the punditry you hear from, you know, oh, in my day, this would have happened, that is, is just boring. Um, but actually, Lee Dixon, who, like I said, I think is a good pundit and a good analyst, he was saying... Um, you know, look at our turn next time Arsenal concede a goal, turn around and look at them, look at every single player and look at what happens. And um it's all the same. It's all very kind of tut, look to the heavens and trudge back to the to the uh, centre circle. And he was kind of saying, you know, verging on the in my day territory, but he was saying like, you know, when I was at Arsenal, um I didn't actually have that many friends there. We weren't, you know, we weren't always a particularly friendly group um towards each other away from the pitch but you know we 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 kind of got stuck into each other when we had to and you you really don't see that at arsenal so it i don't know it just it just feels a bit weird to see such indifference on the pitch and then for there to be a fight at half time or before the game i don't know like like where was that on the pitch it, um, i mean well it, what's interesting about dixon just quickly is that he, the last couple of games he's commented on for arsenal uh, he's made the point that he was talking to Steve Bowl during the week yeah. about X, Y, and Z. So he's obviously he's obviously got the pulse, yes. and you kind of think it might it might be very much Steve Bowl's view as to what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Steve Bold is still very much in contact with players like that. We you know we heard about the Chesney thing from John Jensen. Um, John Jensen broke the fact that Chesney was going to be dropped, um, and he said that he wouldn't play again. 
And uh, as it turned out, mm. Chesney, I think, only played two more cup games or something. And that's because John Jensen and Steve Bold still talk to one another. So, again, that makes you, that, you know, raises questions about what's going on behind the scenes. Um because you're right, that, those players, they do talk to each other. I think Alan Smith said something similar. He said something like, you know, Steve Bold isn't getting the freedom he thought he'd get when he took the job. And again, Steve Bold and Alan Smith do talk to one another. So it's, I don't know, that it, it's really weird because it, it does seem like there is a lack of harmony behind the scenes, but it doesn't look like anyone's um, putting up their dukes about it. So I am a little bit dubious about that, to be honest. Quick, quick. Uh, follow up, Tim, just really quickly. I mean, you, you've been all these games. You, you've been there for these these low moments. For me, th- I mean, even with the the hammerings we took at Anfield, at Chelsea, in the middle of those seasons, um, this had the the most reverberations of the eight two at Old Trafford. Um, mm-hmm. Did you get that feeling from it? Was it reminiscent of that yeah. in any way? And in, not just in terms of. How the how the game went, but the the feeling during and after. Yeah, yeah, I think so because some of those had mitigating circumstances. When we lost five one to Liverpool that time, yeah, we were really poor, but they were really good, and I think they kind of caught us by surprise and caught us on the hop. Um, I don't think anything Liverpool did was particularly surprising on this occasion. I mean, I suppose they sat off us a bit more. They didn't really press us. They kind of sat off, waited for us to go forward and you know, shoot ourselves in the foot, which is not a bad tactic against Arsenal. But yes, it did, because there's some mitigation in some of those, or you feel like, um, you know, the 6-0 at Chelsea, you just felt like Arsenal went for it too much in the first 20 minutes, and then the game got away from them. This didn't feel like that. This felt like from the first to the last minute, um, that they just weren't really interested. And uh, it was it was just absolutely inevitable. It was always just a case about 10 minutes in, I was thinking, yeah, this could get really ugly. And it was still nil-nil. And we were still well in the game. And I, I just thought, this has got like this has got a thrashing written all over it. The, the game, honestly, of all those kind of low moments, I've compared it to the most is the Crystal Palace game, yeah. um, which felt very similar. It just felt like a team that didn't know. And, and even West Brom last year as well, which was, I think, the away game that preceded it, where... The players have just been so confused about what they're meant to be doing for so long that they've just given up trying to work it out. And that's what this felt like. It felt like um, surrender, really. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this has got more reverberations. And were it not for Petr Cech, you know, if you lose 4 0 and your goalkeeper is by far and away, by far and away your man of the match, um, that's a real problem. And it kind of felt like. You know, sometimes when Arsenal win a home game, 4-0, um, you know, well, it doesn't happen as much nowadays, but, you know, five, six years ago, you'd get the odd kind of home game where, I don't know, someone like Sunderland would turn up and they'd play a really high line and would be 3-0 up after half an hour and would stroll and win like 4-0 or 4-1. And you'd watch the highlights back and you'd go, why, why did they come here and play a high line? Or someone like <laughs> yeah. Aston Villa, that's a team we've, we've walloped a lot over the last couple of years. And you think... Why have they put their centre backs on the halfway line? What were they expecting to happen? And you think, you know, thanks very much for making that really simple for us. What was your team talk about? We specialise in I that. Felt, <laughs> yeah, that's what I felt like watching Arsenal. I was watching them thinking, what were you talking about before the game? What, like, why, why are you, why are you doing this? Why are you playing like this? You're not only are you playing terribly, but you're totally playing into the hands of, you know, quite possibly the best attacking side in the Premier League at the moment. Yeah, it's crazy. Paul, the the thing that I think is really damning for me is the summer is when your manager gets the chance to come up with a plan and then try to implement it. There are no games. You have a preseason to see what you've got. Even if you make no additions, you know who your players are and you can try to mold the team around what you've got. And you should have a good idea by the time mid-August rolls around of what you're working with and how you want to implement it. And it certainly doesn't seem to be the case here, but there may be no greater example of how little a grasp the manager has on his own team or his own plan than what's going on with the center backs. So I just want to touch on that for a minute. Rob Holding starts the first game. He's dropped to the U23s for the second game. He's starting at Anfield. Kolasinac is is a center back that he's dropped. Mertesacker can't get in. Gabriel and Mustafi seemingly going, and we can get into why Mustafi's going if we want to, but I, I don't know that anyone knows specifically, but clearly something's up there. 
is the center back situation the clearest example of the manager not having a grip on the the size of the job at this point and what do you make of what's going on with our with our center backs i think that's a great point i mean you and i always have the potential to see things differently but I, I think, <laughs> that's a I, polite way to put it yeah, <laughs> you could just I say think, you're a prick and i hate you you know whatever uh, I've heard it both ways I, you're a prick and i love you yeah no, that's you know. how i feel I yeah it. you're a good man you're yeah. a good man you as well. um yeah so to me you couldn't have picked a better uh illustration of how the manager at the moment has no feel for what he's doing. The center back th- thing is just a mess. Uh, almost, apart from what he does with Kishelny, uh, uh and that's kind of his easy decision. Is he available or is he, is he not? By the way, just a quick other- pause button t- for all of us. I think it's hilarious. If you remember our one takeaway is we all kind of agreed we're not going to judge this team until we saw Koss and Alexis in the side. So, so yeah. how'd that work out? Anyway, go ahead. To, to be fair to the manager, given that we're about to sell Alexis, this was the only time we were ever going to get a chance to there see them go. in the side together. Um, anyway. So, yeah, it, it's... Uh, uh, again, I don't think it even bears discussing, kind of like what Clive said. The, there's no discussing to be done because it's all just... None of it makes sense. Uh, and so uh, I went for a run yesterday evening and the adrenaline was still high in my system and and the i have these moments of clarity and afterwards you work out was that just endorphins or was that actual clarity my endorphin moment was uh arson was desperate arson's a fighter arson was desperate to claw his way back at the end of last season he got the team uh, enough on the same page to bail out our season and to he then gave them a win one for the Gipper speech to win the FA Cup. He fights his way back, desperate to get back his position, his job to prove a point. But it was one of those things where he he was so desperate to get it back, he hadn't really worked out whether he really wanted it after the fact. You know, in the cold light of day when all the emotions settled down, uh, kind of like Clive's point about not having a plan, I think he hit this summer. You know, we had a couple of players lined up. We moved quickly. We the the mood was changing for all of us. We were all thinking, well, m- he should have retired, but maybe this might be okay for a season or two while we get ourselves lined up for a transition. And I just think the he hadn't got any further than three or four months where he fought his way out of a corner and got the job back, and then, you know. D- Decision making and plan is great, but you kind of need the emotions to be lined up. You ne- kind of need to have your own internal act together. And I think a lot of what he talked about along the way about, you know, he'd see how he's, he'd feel, etc., in terms of whether he wanted to take take the job on for another couple of years. Well, I think he was always going to say yes. He did need to go through a process of working out what he wanted to do and and whether he was up to it and whether he had the energy. And I think it took too much out of him to get the job, to get the extension, to to fight off the detractors on the board, potentially to be fighting off Ivan, to 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 win the position. And then he just, he looked at it and I, I think he was crossing his fingers that he could turn these players around, that he'd get Sanchez to sign, that he could get Ozil to sign, that he could get Chamberlain to sign. Um and I don't think he's come up with a new plan, which is why he's still on the persuade Chamberlain to stay by playing him, even when it was clear that Chamberlain was going anyway. I don't think he's been able to make the adjustments because I think he's a mess inside. Yeah, I think he realizes he's out of his depth and he's, he's, a, he's a team of one. And he's got no answers. This is the problem with not having a director of football and not having the structure above you, though, because instead of being able to see the clear tactical implications of the team he was picking, he's picking teams based on contract situations. That's what happens when your director of football is also your manager. It becomes difficult to divorce the internal power structures, the internal contract situations, the internal dynamic of this team from the match day tactics. And you have a manager picking his team and running the team on the pitch 
in reference to or as a result of what's happening off the pitch. And that is not Arson's fault entirely. That is the fault of having too many responsibilities. Does that make sense? You know, I mean, it does. The, the idea I, I, that I think he's got no answers. I think he knew, I think he's he started to panic a week or two ago when the contract situations weren't turning around and he realized he still had no answers. And I think he just went with his default mode at the moment because he doesn't know what to do. As the team is slipping away from him, as the team begins to realize he's got no answers again, I think it's all just gone across the board, tits up on him. Yeah. And he's got nobody in his corner. He's got nobody coming in. He's the slowest decision maker about incomings. I think, you know, the story that uh, Gazidis bought uh, Mustafi and bought Perez, which I... I uh, almost, I wouldn't say it was quite against Arson's uh, wishes, but making decision late in the winding window because Arson didn't, I find entirely plausible at the moment. And he's just the slowest decision maker at a time when he needed to be able to make quick decisions. I, I think, I think he's lost. Yeah, and I'm sorry, you don't get to brag. I'm sorry he didn't cost fifty million pounds about Rob Holding, who you're ruining, by the way while turning around and spending $35 million on Mustafi and loaning him to enter the next year. Like, I'm, you just don't get to have it both ways. Clive, yeah. um, gosh, there's a, there's a lot here. Um, and, and I think, <laughs> you know, the one, the one bit of sympathy I have for Arsenal is this. If I were Arsenal manager, if I were in my dream job, if I were that wedded to an organization and a job and had that much pride and ego surrounded in it, the only way I'd leave that job is if they literally dragged me out of the building, took my badge away, and you know, posted do not admit signs all over the building. That's how I would go out of that job. I wouldn't go out honorably and say, I've done my bit. It's time for me to walk away. I have absolutely every respect for Arson wanting to stay until they drag him out. The problem is there's no one at the club there to drag him out. And the the, the person who winds up suffering is Arson because it's his legacy on the line now. And we'll come to that in a moment. But Clive, in the wake of this game, there are a lot of ramifications, and we, we come to where we are today with Oxley chamberlain looking to go to Chelsea and Alexis seemingly going to City, Mustafi going out on loan. Let me ask you this. Is there any scenario where this season can be salvaged, or would you prefer that we blow it up, that we sell Ozil, sell Alexis, sell Ox, collect as much money as possible, not let this manager spend it, and hope to God that maybe Arson himself or the powers above him decide it's time to move on after this season? We finish wherever we finish, 10th, 12th, 13th. I mean, let's not forget Chelsea finished you know, two-thirds of the way down the table and won the league the next season. It's not the end of the world but then bring in a new manager, bring in a director of football and spend all that money next season? Or would you still be saying that there's a responsibility to the fans to try to make something of this season? Um, I would I would blow it up. I, I, would, I would blow it up. I'm, I'm going to stop you this. just for a second because sometimes the NSA does listen in on these things. So just to be clear, Clive is not talking <laughs> about actually blowing anything up. He's a very nice man. This is a metaphor. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I would blow it up big time, and and the reason why no one cared for the three thousand fans at Liverpool at the weekend, they just didn't care. Right, they gave those points away, um, and I, I would blow it up. I, I never want to go for the Europa League. We can't. I, I didn't think we could focus on multiple competitions. I, I well, think we have to go for it now. I mean, because the league is fucking yeah. gone. <laughs> no, no, I would, I would just blow it up. I, I would just, I would just remove the people that are impacting the culture, right? And how you change a culture, you change a culture by removing the people that have a disproportionate influence on your organisation, and with one person that has a, a much bigger influence than he should have, and it needs to start there, right? And it needs to start at the manager. It'd be great if we could do do something with the um, the board and leadership, but that's too much to to um, to ask. Um, so it needs to happen. It's not because I don't like the man. It's just because every man has his moment in the sun. I'm not the same man I was 10 years ago. It's as simple as that, right? And we all have our peak working years. And he's just gone past his. He just has not recognized it. And I don't think he's panicking. I just don't think he can see. If I could buy him a present, I would buy him a full-length mirror so he could see himself as we all see him. Because I don't think Maybe he can Maybe that would see. help him zip up his coat. Yeah, exactly. I think he's like a boxer, right? You always think you can win the next fight. And in football, there's, there's one thing that's guaranteed – there's going to be another game and he's probably already thinking about it and he's thinking if I can get a home win and if I can get a draw at Chelsea they'll all love me again and I start to question I mean I listened to Tim who I have to say mate did a great job on the Ask Cast last week I listened to Tim go through 
some of your thought process. And on my bike ride yesterday, I, I had I had my moment of clarity, and I was thinking about. When do I get um, mine? I want one. <laughs> get your lazy arse out there and exercise, Elliot. <laughs> it's free for everybody. <laughs> Exactly. I had. I, I was thinking about lots of things. I, I had my moment of clarity, and, uh, and it, it just comes down to him. And I'm wondering, it, it, are his priorities still where they used to be? I wonder. I wrote something today on, on online, and I questioned not his direct love for the club, but why he does it. And I think it's far more related to his position in the game, his position at the club the power he wields. And it feels like some of these decisions around some of the players that are going, these stat DNA players, it does feel like an executive power play. And then we're talking about blowing it up. Yes, I would blow it up, but then he needs to go too. What The most important thing, what's my priority, is to break this cycle of every time we don't win two games, we end up on the floor on a broken cannon. We have to break that. We are vulnerable, weak, and getting smaller by the week, where people can pick off our players, agents can pick off, they can get their players' pensions. We are looking weak, we're overspending, we're not efficient financially, we're not efficient people-wise, we're not growing, we have a survivalist manager that wants to survive while everyone else around us is thriving, because they have a fresh new project that people want to join. And you heard me say before about being the employer of choice. And the reason why I said that months and months ago, because it's my biggest fear. When Asi Cole left Arsenal, I was stunned by it. It really hurt me. The things that he could go to another club in London. Do you think we can go to Spurs now and take their captain? No chance. We have fallen. Think it through. We are fallen. We are smaller. We are not the place where people want to be. No. And if I'm building a strategy for the club, the top mission statement would be make this the employer of choice, number one. What am I going to do to build that strategy? What has to change? What do we have to do as the club? And when you do that, when you make a place, a place where people want to be and would cry to leave, not want to stay and build their pensions, but cry to leave because you've got the right culture in place. Once we fix that, we got a chance. At the moment, we're just marking time until the next defeat. Yeah, and it, it, it breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. Well, and, and you look at the wages we put some players on, and the way we've we've backed ourselves into a corner with our wage structure. And the, the manager's been too slow to react to that, too slow to change that, too slow to get rid of the players who were causing that problem. You know, I think in modern football, you have to have stars who are on one wage and role players who yeah. are on another. And if those role players aren't happy, then you find others because they're much more replaceable than your stars, right? I mean, you need to have a few guys on 250, 300,000 a week and some other guys that are on 80. And if the 80 guys aren't happy, you can replace them. But you can't as easily yeah. replace the guys who are on 300. Um, you know, none of us wanted to lose Alexis because we felt he wasn't replaceable. Does anyone feel that Ramsey or... Uh, Shaka or, well, Shaka may be a bad example to some extent, but you know, any of these guys, Theo, Ox, none of these guys are not replaceable. They're all replaceable. It's your stars that aren't replaceable that you build around, that you put on that big wage, and then you fill in around them. And, you know, the, the best clubs in our in our league do not have 20 great players. They may have four stars, seven really good players, and then a bunch of, you know, who knows, mediocre guys, guys that maybe would start for you, maybe wouldn't, but that that's good enough. And I, I just don't think the manager knows how to build a, a, a good a good squad today. And part of that, I think, is also because tactically, he doesn't understand how to get the most out of a squad. You know I mean? Our squad has certain characteristics that allow it to play a certain way, and he hasn't figured out what those characteristics are because I don't think any of us believe we have a bad first 11. Is that a bad first 11? No, And you look at Liverpool, right? And you look at the purchases over the last couple of years. Mane. Uh, from then, Southampton. Salah from, from Roma. Sa I, I mean, these, yeah, he's Salah. not buying Barcelona and Real Madrid players. He's not buying they, Mbappe for $120 million. He's making what it he's work. Doing, what he's for doing, me, Elliot, he's buying, he's yeah, buying players play. and he's buying them and he's fitting them to a style. Yes. Yeah. Right? So, so we and are... They've lined up Keita. I, I mean, that's just that, that is, That's heartbreaking. Move. My God. So, so, so Paul, yeah. that, is, that is a really good point. And, and I just want to ask you really quick, Paul, and then Tim, I'll come to you in a second. But, I mean, mm. can you believe, Paul, that 
through all of this, the one thing anybody who looked at Arsenal would say is there is a major problem in central midfield, and he does not seem to see it at all. Can you understand or explain? I mean, we talked about what's happening in the defense where it seems to be a mess, but the fact that he doesn't address the midfield. He doesn't see it. it that, that's a terrible blind spot. He doesn't, and he's never, he's never seen it. I mean, even from the Fabregas years, you know, we always, really since, you know, you had your, your Petit and your uh, uh, Gilberto, um, kind of since then, you know, we had the Danielson experiment. It, 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 he at least seemed to know what he was trying to get there. And then after that, you know, just a series of weird combinations. Our, our best one since those years was probably Cazorla and Coquelin, which was on neither side of that deliberate um and you look at you, you know i i get the john michael uh seri discussion um you got kate I, I i like the idea that we were in for lamar but then you hear that liverpool are back in from him when it, it, it's just like when he said marcia wasn't available from monaco a couple of years ago and now suddenly uh, lamar may be available now maybe that turns out to just be a rumor but it, it just seems like we don't have a plan. We, uh, Keita is just genius. They couldn't get him this year, but they have it lined up for next year. Talk about planning. It's Well, I mean, and you look at it, and it, I'm sorry, but in a golden generation of young French talent, the fact that he can't get any of it is very telling. It yeah. tells you about his his status among those players now. Those players probably know better than anyone that the, the man has probably passed his best. And I, I think, you know, you look at it on the ball. What you do on the ball is driven a lot by talent. What you do off the ball is driven a lot by preparation. And there may be no worse team in the Premier League off the ball than Arsenal. Mm. And that is preparation. That's not talent. Anyone can be good off the ball. Now, don't get me wrong. There's instincts and energy and work rate and pace and all those things that can make you better. But I do believe that how you perform off the ball is about how you're drilled, how you're set up, what your tactics are. And there is no worse team off the ball that I can see than Arsenal Football Club. Tim, th there is still a season. We're three games in. And by the way, you know, I, it yeah. tells you about the coherence of your plan. If after your third game, your plan is in shambles, right? In tatters. You know, how good was the plan if three games are all it takes to, to, to lay it bare? Um, I, there's a great tweet making the rounds. I have to apologize to the gentleman who put it out there because I, I don't have it in front of me. But it basically, he's like, this is the first case I've ever seen where the manager lost the dressing room and they sacked the dressing room. Um, <laughs> but there is a season still to come. If you were appointed yeah. manager tomorrow or, or you were the conciliary for, for Arsene Wenger, uh, the sort of uh, apocryphal David Dean, what, what moves can be made and should be made now to make something of this season, or is it literally a case of blow it up, the season's done, collect the cash, and, and start thinking for the future? I mean, it's, it's not done um, by any means. If you look at 2011 12, we started worse than this, and uh, we finished third in the end. Um, so it's not, you know, it, it's not done by any means. It's only because, understandably, we all feel so... We're kind of projecting about what's going to happen. Well, in the 8-2 the season after the trolley dash, we came in the top four again. You know, I mean, it just so happens yeah, yeah, there, are, there are probably five better teams than us, clearly better teams than us right now. Of course, but also history tells you that what usually happens is that Wenger muddles through. Uh, oh, you, you we, said 2011. That was the 8-2 season, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah okay, yeah, my, yeah, my bad. So there. I basically repeated what you said. So cool. Glad, yeah, glad, yeah. I, glad I was there to help. Anyway, <laughs> and yeah, we we muddled through with the likes of uh, Arteta and Benny Yoon, and uh, we finished third. Um, don't think that will happen this time for the for the reasons you suggest, and also because at that point um, the squad was just nowhere near complete. Whereas when you look at this squad, I mean, I agree with you guys. It's only central midfield that I look at and think, yeah, we definitely need someone there. I think the rest of it's a decent squad. It just needs a plan. And uh, this is what I was saying last week. I'm, I'm not massively exercised about whether it's a back three, a back four, a back five, a back two, you know, five in midfield, three in midfield, one up front, three up front. Like, I'm not exercised about any of that. But I just want something that this manager believes in. I want him to do something that he believes in. And, you know, with the 
the kind of three at the back at the end of last season, which we all know was a move of desperation because he had nothing left up his sleeve. And he pretty much admitted it at the time. I, I was writing an article today and I dug out his quotes from after that Middlesbrough game. And uh, literally the title of the link on Arsenal.com is back three move could be temporary. Um, and I don't think any of us at any point have been convinced that that this was here to stay, that at the first sign of trouble it would go. And I would bet any money you like that we'll be back to a back four against Bournemouth. But what it, what it kind of did even if it was only short term and it was a confidence trick, which the manager pretty much said it was, it at least gave us something to build on. It wasn't scintillating, it wasn't perfect, but it seemed to at least stabilise us. It allowed us to put the light back on in the room and see where everything was rather than thrashing around in the dark. You know, It was like, right, let's just do this until you know we can maybe come up with something better. But at the moment... This is probably seven out of ten, um, but that's a lot better than the three and four out of ten we had before that. So let's build the confidence back up. Let's get them used to playing in a system, whether it's the one you want in the long term. If you want to change it after that, once you feel that they've got the confidence and the momentum to do that. Um, and if you're going to play like a reserve team in the Europa League and therefore you've got more time with your first team to train them, then, then fine. But, I mean, he's already, like, it's like, the the phrase I used in the article, um, to give you a teaser for Thursday, was, you know, it was it was a piece of driftwood that he clung on to. And he's decided to set the thing on fire. He, he his, did it, Tim. He did yeah. it to us. He, the opposition didn't do it. He did it. He was yeah, the one yeah. that started picking two left-backs in there. Exactly. And, he's, and he's broke it down. Yeah, he, who he would do that? He's taken the one thing that he was able to find that could could stabilize a situation that looked like it was va- rapidly deteriorating, turned it's it like into sabotage, miraculously, it? miraculously turned it into an FA Cup victory and and semi-final victory over two of the best teams in England and and went out and bought players that arguably strengthened the system and then yeah. made the insane choices to undermine the system. And, I mean, maybe it's a yeah. case of he never wanted to be playing in it. It was the players who originally wanted to be playing in it that he always saw the back four as the system to go to, and he refused to play the players he needed to to, to succeed in a back three. But, I mean, if that isn't the most over self-destructive time, move ever. We, over a period of time, he's learned how to play a back three like he used to play a back two when we're in possession. Mm-hmm. It's just everybody's – I mean, when you think of the That's Bellerin moment on that point. goal. That's a really good point, Paul. That's a really good yeah. point. I mean, the, the oh, idea that there. that he's he's taken this back three system and found a way to make it look out of possession like his back four system did look totally insecure and with tons and tons of green grass behind it. I, I'm going to get to you in two seconds, Paul and Clive. I, I think we'll, we'll start to wrap up, but there's still a couple of things to get to here. And just one thing, Tim, I'm curious to hear your perspective on just as a man who had tremendous admiration for Arsene Wenger and I'm not saying that you no longer do but certainly no longer I think do for the job he's doing now Mm. to what extent is it possible if at all for his legacy to be damaged as this continues yeah that that, that's exactly the subject I've I've taken up this week and and right would you like to would you like to pass that (laughs) or do you want to give us just the Um, tiniest little preview I'll, I'll, I'll be really short on it basically um Every game, every minute that this goes on without his resignation, um, he's chipping away at it. Yes, I think he'd come to a stage where, you know, once enough emotional distance had been put between everything, people would look at, you know, the top four years, not ungenerously. I think, yeah, actually, that wasn't too bad. And once his successor does whatever his successor is going to do, that with some distance and with some perspective, you know, those wounds would heal. Now we, you know, that horse is bolting now. And now we're going into kind of right at the moment, he's going to be remembered as a once great manager who went on for too long and how much we shift to that end of the spectrum purely depends on how much longer he goes on for now. And, um, you know, it's, it's not quite going to get to, Brian Clough territory because hopefully he won't become an alcoholic and get us relegated. Um, <laughs> I might become an alcoholic, but l- let's hope that Arsene doesn't. But it, it's getting into that territory now. You know, it's getting into. We're already in 
um, in my opinion, great manager that went on for too long. And w- the longer this goes on, the more pronounced that's going to be. Yeah, and I, I sadly have to agree with you. And I think that I've never thought he deserves abuse. Abuse is not warranted, period. I mean, we even see we see it in areas outside of football, too. It's got nothing to do with, with arson. I just don't think abuse is warranted. But outside of the abuse, it is easy to see how people could start to lose respect for him. Paul, um, I think there is one thing we haven't mentioned. We haven't talked Stan Kroenke and Ivan Gazidis on this pod. Mm, I, I like to stay away from it for a simple reason. While I oh. definitely believe they are a problem, I definitely believe that. I think that raising the specter of them is a separate issue from the manager. And I think Arsene Wenger is making mistakes that don't require Gazidis and, and Kroenke to be involved in for them to stand alone and re- deserve their own analysis. Is Kroenke a problem for the club? Of course. Does Gazidis appear to be a problem for the club? Of course. Is Arsene Wenger a problem for the club independent of that? He is. Now, you could say they're they're interwoven because if Kroenke and Gazidis had any control over the club, they would not have re-signed Arsene, or at a minimum, Gazidis would have left when he lost that power play. But So I don't want people to think that we are absolving them of responsibility for being part of the downturn of the club. I just think that's a separate discussion, that, that Arsene Wenger merits his own discussion, and so does the football. And so... I just play fantasy manager for me quickly, Paul. Um, addition by subtraction. Forget who you would bring in. Right now, a couple days left of the window, you can sell anybody or everybody to recoup the market rate fees that they would recoup. Who are you selling? Ozil and Alexis. Is that it? I mean, Ox- uh, Oxley Chamberlain too, I assume? I'd keep Mustafi because I'm wrong to be wanting to sell him. Well, uh, yeah. What, the, what about Ox, by the way? Just real quick. Oh, yeah, he's gone. Okay, Ox, Alexis, Ozil, anyone else? Uh, well, I mean, that's the that's where the real money is. The problem is you won't sell. There isn't a taker for Ozil, so that that's a major problem. Obviously, there are the list of players who are going out. Given that we might change formation and Theo will be tough to shift, probably keep him. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll take suggestions here. Or, or or whatever, but those, to me, if you got rid of, you take your sixty or seventy for Sanchez. Uh, I thought it was always dodgy, even if he doesn't kick, go around kicking up a fuss. It was always massively dodgy to be betting your season on him. Um, well, so, I mean, if, if we've always we've discussed this, right? If you're keeping yeah. Alexis and Ozil and Ox and any of those guys, you're doing it because you're quote going for it this season, and the other moves the manager made are not the moves of a manager who's going for it, quote unquote. Yeah, uh, and I, I still think it was a crock. I've never seen anybody with their, you know, three of their stars that all that are all basically saying, "I don't believe in this. I, I'm not resigning." I mean, no, he said it's an ideal it. situation. You don't believe him? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What I, about I, Ram- what about Ramsey? What what just I mean, here's a guy who is clearly him? talented. Yeah. He's going to be in the last year of his deal next summer and he's he to me is is different from Ox in this respect. I don't think yeah. Ox will be anything different than what he's been at Arsenal at Chelsea. I really don't. But Aaron Ramsey's a tougher one. You can see there's a very very talented football in there crying out for stru- crying out for structure and he doesn't have it at Arsenal. Do you hold him hoping that the next manager gets that great football out of him by introducing structure or do you sell him before you wind up in the very same position with him next summer that you are with these guys this summer? Well, I'd only sell Ramsey if I had a way of getting a, a, a John Michael Seri in or somebody like that or a Lamar or something like that. He's, he's a, he's a really good player. Um, I just think there's an opportunity to redraw our midfield and keep Ramsey blocks that it determines the kind of in midfield uh, we're going to have. So I- if I had a chance to just get a clean slate in midfield of all places, our attack's good enough. Our defense is good enough in large part. Midfield is the piece with all these weird jigsaw pieces in it. So could, if I could swap everybody out in midfield, uh, probably the only player I'd hold on to is Chaka. And even that, depending on my options, I'd like somebody who can do what he can do, but more mobile. Sorry, Elio. He needs to be next um, to a Conte or something, doesn't he? Like some, he someone, does. someone does. who can clean up and destroy and, and shuff, you know, shuttle back and forth. And, and he, he just yeah. can't be that guy when Ramsey's 30 yards ahead of him. 
Um, well, with just a couple of days to go in the window, I'd still sell. Uh, uh, I think this is going to be a problem replacing anybody, but I'd still move uh, Sanchez. And I'd probably say if I could get a decent offer for Ozil, I'd do it too, because I just don't think that's good mojo for the next eight, nine months for the rest of the team. I, th- I think you, you pick players who want to be there and you find ways of getting it done. And there is other, other ways of forming the team. And when a player is half blessing, half curse like Ozil uh, or like Sanchez is just too dominant a personality, um, you don't – at this point, why not? Yeah, I mean I, Take I, the money. I don't feel like we need to keep any of them. There's no player that I say he's the cornerstone of the future of Arsenal. You know, that is something that you have to you have to ask. You look at any great team, and somewhere in that team you'd like to believe there's a player who you say, you know, we've got a lot of high-priced mercenaries, or we've got a lot of superstars, but this player, player X, is the cornerstone of a future great team, and we're kind of built around him for the next five, six years or so. And I mean, who's that guy at Arsenal? Who's the guy at Arsenal that you look and you say the next five years of football at Arsenal Football Club are about this player and where he's going and where who he's going to become? Um, what about you, Clive? I mean, how would you reshape Arsenal to to fix what's broken? I mean, apart from a new manager. Yeah, uh, we have to decide on the style. I, you know, I, I did like the three at the back, and I still do. I see formations as tools, right? And you look, you have these tools in your toolbox and you reach in and you pick out a tool for a certain job. The fact we changed the back three was one of the most exciting things for me last season. And he built on it and built it into the, a fantastic cup final performance where I felt the way we played it was better than Chelsea have ever played it. But then he, as Tim, when we spoke earlier, he broke that down. So we're heading back towards the back four. But then we have to decide who are our people. If it's Ramsey, then we have to play three in midfield. We cannot pretend any longer he is a midfielder in a two because any team with any brain is going to go straight through that. Right, so we just can't do this any longer. We can't do it to we've had it's not his fault. He's allowed to do it. I see Ramsey as almost like a Freddie Lundberg type player and when I liked him the most was when he played on the right in the 4-2-3-1 where he could go where he liked but he always had the energy to to get close to Hector to block out the right side but but then he became an asset in his movement but when now he plays exactly the same way from a structural position and when the team needs something else and Graham Sinise was brilliant on TV yesterday and he, and he captures what a centre midfield was all about when you play in centre midfield, you have to feel the game. You look at the game, you're the brain of the team, and you feel it. And you take certain actions from the temperature of the game. You don't just turn up and say, I'm a midfielder that makes forward runs and start running. When the game hasn't called for it, it's not in control, it's not settled yet. You stay behind the ball, you build play, you settle the game down. Uh, we, But you know what? He's allowed to do it. You've heard me say it before. He's allowed to do it. Shaka's allowed to do what he does. Ozil's allowed not to run back. Oxley chain is allowed to sulk. These, it's not just one player. So what would I do? I would, I would decide who are my pillars. I would decide to say, okay, maybe if Ozil's staying because we've got no buyers and Alexis is going... I, I do like the look of Julian Draxler. I do like the look of that type of player and say, OK, let's go a little bit German. We've got two Germans coming to our backroom staff in a year's time. Look at a Germanic culture going forward. Potentially do that. Look at Goretzka in centre midfield. And look at somebody like Stephen Inzonzi, an upgrade to Elneny, a tall, physical, very good one-touch Busquets type passer a good player to actually give Shaka the confidence he needs and play three in midfield. You know, play Shaka, Ramsey and Nzonzi and make sure people can't run through our middle. If you've got a situation where we've conceded the second most shots in the whole Premier League in 2017, don't tell me it's working. It's, it's just not working. That's an astounding statistic, yeah. I mean, Only Sunderland have conceded more than us. No one has conceded I mean, more big chances among the top six teams than we have this season. No one has conceded more uh, chances from the "quote unquote" danger zone, the the six yard box extended to the eighteen yard box. I mean, but our fan, us fans, we are we are just as guilty. We've got a split in our fan base about the effectiveness of certain players, and 
but you've only got to look at that. You look at that and say, okay, something needs to change. And it's not another centre half. It's the structure of the team and it's the psychology and mentality of the team yeah. and what's allowed, what's acceptable. And I don't like to pick on certain players, although I do have, we all have our favourites. I do. But they, <laughs> they, are, they are allowed to do it, right? And, then, and they're not dropped to the bench. I was astounded to see Ramsey come off at half time because he's the last person that comes off. Maybe he did have an injury. Um, but you know what? He's indicative of, of the culture that's allowed. There are many, many others we could pick on if we wanted to. Um, but I want to see that change. Fix the problems that's there. If you're conceding that many goals, fix that first. Fix that. Only West Ham conceded more than us. Fix it. Yeah. Change the structure of your team. Fix it. Change the culture. Build it by getting clean sheets. Be prepared to fix a problem that's in front of you with a level of urgency and professionalism because people are well-informed the listener, listenership to this podcast and the people on this podcast and many, many hundreds of thousands of Arsenal fans, they know what they're watching. You can't mug them off any longer. You just can't. We've got information and data. You can't mug us off. Fix the problems. If you're not prepared to fix them, then you, you shouldn't be at our club. Look, I mean, it, you can't have big games go this way time and time and time and time and time again. And, and believe that something isn't fundamentally wrong beyond the players you're putting on the pitch because these big clubs play other teams and don't beat them as badly as they beat us. Um, you know, I, I think yeah. we've become excellent rationalizers, you guys, and I think as Arsenal fans what happened is after the winning years left us and we went into the banter era, the austerity era, whatever you want to call it, the stadium move, we came up with this excuse for Arson. And the excuse was two things. One was... All right, maybe we're not winning titles, but we play the most beautiful football in England. Arsene Wenger produces beautiful football, and we appreciate that. And we admire that, and that's something that other teams wish they could do. You know, you used to hear other other teams' fans defend Arsene by saying, "Oh, poor Arsenal fans have to be subjected to the prettiest football in England." The other thing we used to say is he builds a team the right way. He he puts his faith in youth. He develops players. He doesn't just go. You know, he's not a checkbook manager. Neither of those things are true anymore. They're just not. The football he plays is not the prettiest. It's not even uh, aesthetically appealing. And there's nothing pretty about playing tactically inept football. There's nothing pretty about putting 10 guys in the opposition half. That's not attacking football. That's stupidity. And as far as being a checkbook manager, he just doesn't know how to use it. It's not that he doesn't use it. He doesn't know how. He spent $35 million on Mustafi. He's loaning him to enter the next day, uh, next, next year, next day, just about. Um, you know, he spends $50 million on Lacazette and doesn't play him in the first big away game. The, the manager has spent, he spent, look how much money he spent on Shaka and still to this day not totally clear that he has any idea who the player is and how to use him. So this is a manager who, when he spends, doesn't necessarily get it right. This is a manager who doesn't produce beautiful football anymore. And I, I think back to Tim's point from the other pod, you know, good managers improve the team, average managers, and then bad managers make decisions that make the team worse. Right now, Arsene Wenger, every decision he makes seems to make us worse, and it's it's hard to see how it doesn't turn into an avalanche at this point. And Tim, I'll leave you with this. Do you think there's a scenario where Arsene Wenger does not finish this season? Uh, no, I, I think that's it for two years. Um, Do you think the whole contract, he, he's staying? I, see, I think yeah. he's gone next summer. I don't think there's any chance he's back for another season. Uh, I, th I think he will be because there's only two people that matter in this equation. That's Stan Kroenke. He's not going to sack him. And Arsene, if he's still here, then um, there we go. He's going to stay, isn't he? Like I'll, I'll said, give you one reason why I, I, I disagree with that, and then I'll let you finish. But uh, mm. Stan Kroenke gave a contract extension to the manager, the coach of his Los Angeles Rams, at the time St. Louis Rams, a, a manager who had slipped into abject mediocrity. Uh, you could Jeff, argue with Jeff, Fisher, was Jeff Fisher. And by the way, Arsene Wenger, you know, Jeff Fisher isn't, isn't fit to lace Arsene's boots. That's not my point. But he gave him a two-year deal, got ridiculed for it, Things got off to an immensely bad start, and he fired him within weeks. So he has some previous for this. Anyway, go on, Tim. Yeah, but he, he lives there, so he, he feels that. Fair, he, fair uh, point. <laughs> um, he's, he's, he's not here, so uh, it all falls on deaf ears. I'm absolutely certain that Stan Kroenke will do absolutely nothing um, in, unless maybe we're fighting relegation, which I don't see happening either. Um, famous last words, maybe. Um, <laughs> that would be Arson, interesting. If, if Arsene's got the brass neck to still be here, now on Tuesday evening after that game and after West Brom and Crystal Palace and all these, you know, after, you know, this massive accumulative thing, then he's not going to go because, you know, it, 
he's he'll have to really go some to oversee a worse um, more uncommitted performance than the one we saw on Sunday well I like it is impossible to understand how, um, how, where the light bulb moment comes from. You know, his players, for quite a lot of this calendar year, have downed tools, and he's not stupid. He can see that, but he is still hanging on. I happen to think that's because he's terrified of what comes next, but that's just me speculating. I don't really know the man, so I can't say that with any certainty, but... If, you know, like I said, we're we're now 52 hours at the time of recording after that Liverpool game and there is no indication that he is going to resign. And that tells you that um, this isn't about what is best for Arsenal um, anymore. That's not what is first foremost in, in Arsene Wenger's mind. And while that's the case, um, I just don't see it. If, if he's not resigning now, he's not going to. And... You know, the thing is, it, it's easy when we're low to believe that everything is bad. We have very, very good players. <laughs> like, if you named the 11 best players that you could put on the pitch for us, other than United and maybe City, I don't know that you'd say there are better teams. You can't tell me that a Conte or a Pep or a Klopp or, as much as I hate you a minute, maybe even a Jose couldn't organize this team into something far better than the sum of its parts. Final word, Paul? Yeah, I was keen to get in on this. We can't really expand on it too much, but uh, my dog feels very strongly on this, so you wanted to get Let's a word in. Yeah, what, what do you want to say? <laughs> he thinks we're underestimating Ivan Gazidis, and I think he's right. I think his position is only becoming more and more essential for all the reasons you've just outlined. I think... Uh, but didn't he already lose the power struggle? I mean, wasn't his moment to take the why, reins... Why do we think it's just one moment, though? Well, I mean, I mean when he didn't he, want Arson re-signed, and Arson got re-signed, and he wanted to put in a director of football, and Arson said no, and he didn't put in a director of football. Isn't that sort of the moment? to stand cranky now that he was right and Arson was wrong? Yeah, I mean, well, look, I will say this. If, if Gazidis has anything about him, there were only two possibilities after that happened. One, quit. Okay, if you have any integrity, quit. Two continue to fight the good fight and be the voice to the owner that the owner has made the wrong choice. Um, uh, and, and maybe Cranky he will do that. is now as clear as he should be that maybe he got it wrong and, and, and uh, Ivan got it right. Um, you know, why people think he should re have resigned, I don't know. He only gets more right by the day. His PowerPoints age well. And... Uh, I understand Kranke's reluctance to move Wenger on, but uh, Ivan just gets more and more right by the day. And if it's correct that uh, Ivan bought those players last year, Perez and Mustafi, I mean, at this stage, how could it not be the case? When did Arson ever... I mean, he didn't play Perez. Uh, he moves a $35 million, million pound player on the next summer. Loans for no, <laughs> Yeah, Loans for no... It. Because he wants him out. Uh, you know, Gabriel is gone. Uh, El Nenny, he's kind of lukewarm on. And Chaka, he spends his time saying he's still not quite sure what he has there. How are these not players that, that effectively Ivan and Stat DNA and the new structure have got in place in some form or other with some level of buy in from Arson? Uh, I, I think we're underestimating the influence that Ivan has already had. And he's been waiting, Game of Thrones-wise, not because not he's a ruthless bastard, just because he knows what needs to be done. He's the man of the hour. Uh, I, I put it out there that we may be underestimating him. We'll see. I mean, time will tell. Uh, so far, it's time strike one, but, you know, he's not out yet. Um, I think we should leave it there. I think the, the, the good thing is, look, in a way, it's great that it's an interlull right now, just because I can't imagine having to show up to training after that and with everything going on and then having a game this weekend. Like, they go away, they get away from each other, they power around with their buddies, they stop thinking about Arsenal, which may be a, a lesson for all of us, and they come back and maybe feel like it's a bit of a fresh start. The other thing is the window will be closed, and for better or for worse, the players that are still at Arsenal on Friday morning, that's the team we're playing with at least until January. So the focus can be on getting the most out of that as possible. Um, it just sucks to feel in August like the best chance for this club is either for the manager to be gone before the end of the season or just write the season off altogether and hope for change in the summer. And, you know, I, I think after the Community Shield, there was a lot of 
upbeat art. There were a lot of up, upbeat Arsenal fans. And yep. the speed with which we've arrived at this point demonstrates the fragility of the the structures on that, that Arson has built. Um, you know, we are never more than one bad result away from coming apart at the seams. And I don't think you can build a successful club and season around that. Anyway, uh, not not good times to be discussing Arsenal, but always good people to be discussing it with. So I want to thank God of Twitter. Uh, Tim, you can find him on, still, on, on Twitter, at Stilberto. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure as always. Uh, Paul is on Twitter at Pause in My Pants. Thanks, Pause. Woohoo! And Clive, uh, it is a pleasure as always. Thank you. Clive's on Twitter at Clive PAFC. Thank you. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter at Yankee Gunner. Uh, maybe we'll do one next week, sort of post closing of the window, covering all the the smoke once it's cleared a little bit. Or the what do you cover? You cover the what, the wreckage after the smoke closes. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, so we will be back to do that and uh, and then see where the season goes from here. So whatever you need to do to keep yourself from jumping off a tall building, please do it. Stick around because we wouldn't want you to miss the next podcast. We value you and and appreciate you being here. Talk to you soon. Cheers. 